Uh, this one is even easier. Actually, I don't know. There's some new topics that will be brought up here, negotiating project agreements. Um, this is where we agree. Uh, what is it that we're supposed to be delivering on the project? So we have to agree on certain things. So we may negotiate the expectations. Um, and a lot of these expectations are documented in things like a project charter or maybe a statement of work uh, or a schedule with milestones on it. A lot of these things that you see here are expectations from your management or expectations that you've put together and we're supposed to deliver against it. OK, so let me try and cover these and check them off as we go along. So a statement of work. Um, usually would be a document. You can imagine a Word document that says this is what we expect you to do. And a lot of times, if you've ever done any tendering with an external vendor, a lot of times we're starting with a statement of work where, uh, where we say this is the scope of work we want. So for example, you want to build a state-of-the-art conference room to be able to work virtually with your global international team. And so you call a company, a reseller of Cisco that does this thing for you, um, you give them a statement of work. Uh, but in reality, you don't just give them the statement of work, you give them a contract to look at. Before that contract was produced, you had a statement of work, you gave it to the legal team in your organization, they added all of the legal terminology and it became an RFP, a request for proposal. And then these vendors would have bid on this one contract and then you sit with them and you agree on terms and conditions of what they will deliver. The starting point is a statement of work, a statement that says this is the work that we need done. A conference room that supports da 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 um, of this space and size, that's your statement of work. That's your major deliverable. Right, so you may agree on these things and part of what we do as a team to work with a team is we negotiate what that statement of work is going to be. We negotiate milestones and dates that we're supposed to meet on a project, performance reporting expectations. Sometimes we're over expecting, sometimes we're not expecting enough. Pricing and payment terms, you need to agree. This could be with contractors, could be with your team members. Um, with the team members, you know, you just tell them we'll keep your job. You know, we won't fire you. But when you're working with external contractors and so on, you need to agree on these payment terms. These, this is what we mean by negotiations here. Um, also, you need to agree on how often we uh, uh, we can do inspection or whether we have the right to do inspections on the work. What are the quality requirements that we expect? and the acceptance criteria for all the deliverables that we will test it like this and if it's good then it's okay if not then you have to redo it these are the acceptance criteria also what sort of support we expect after they hand over the product we need to agree now a lot of these things end up being on the contract terms and conditions by the way incentives or penalties now with a team you could put incentives that if you finish by this date then you get a day off or you get this kind of you get a voucher to McDonald's, I guess, for a free meal. Um, and then, you know, what are the penalties for companies? Penalties could be a deduction in the amount of money that are being paid. Um, I remember with GE, we had a lot of SLA contracts, which is the next slide that is going to show up. And if we did not meet a certain score by the customer because they get to score us, uh, if you drop below a certain percentage satisfaction, the, the contract allowed them to reduce 5% or 10% depending, right? And so if you contributed to that, you know, the, you know our company would end up firing you because you made us lose money, um, you know, if we didn't really like you. Uh, but anyway, sometimes um, some of these agreements have penalties in, in it. And so we need to, we may need to negotiate them in the beginning before we start the work and the team could be involved in that. Insurance and performance bonds could be placed on some work, especially professional uh, consultancy. Sometimes you have to buy, sometimes, uh, what is it called? Um, I don't know, it's a, it's a type of bond that says that if I was to uh, lose your data or do something like that, um, it, it has a term to it. It's a form of insurance that you can buy, professional. There's personal liability. There's another one that I have in my head I can't think of. It's at the tip of my tongue, you see it? <laughs> so I can't think of it, but I think it's professional. Anyways, it's a form of insurance that you can buy in case something goes wrong as you do on the work. 
so you have to agree on these things and anything you need to agree on, you need to negotiate most of the time. Subcontractor approvals, choosing the subcontractors, you know, terms and conditions with the subcontractors, so terms and conditions are right there. How we deal with changes, um, you know, turnaround time to get a response back on a change. Um, termination clause, what allows you to cancel or not cancel the agreement, a breach, non-breach, whatever it is. What are the criteria for termination? And how do we deal with disputes? Do we go to court? Do we go to a third party? There's a lot of things that we need to negotiate uh, if needed uh, so that we have a proper understanding of the work uh, or maybe at least agreement with the work that we are expected to do. Um, besides that, I want to show you an example of an SLA. It's shown here, service level agreement. Uh, it's, it's like a charter, uh, project charter, which I'll show you at some point. Um, but this is an agreement on the level of service. I, I usually like to read these terms backwards. So it's an agreement on the level of service. It's a contract between a service provider, internal or external, and the end user that describes the level of service expected from the service provider. So you can expect these from like um, help desk, call centers. They don't, they're not really providing you a physical product. What they're providing you is a service. And because it's a service, you need to put, you would put, terms and conditions on what is expected and you know what are the penalties if they don't perform right so you describe the work uh, and there's an example here uh, agreement covers the provision and support of a service which provides end user computer support the desktop computing service consists of the hardware software and supporting infrastructure for user uh, personal computers uh, running the Windows operating system. As a matter of fact, when I was with GE, we had a lot of these service level agreements for similar things because um, we were in the IT uh, department or IT unit. But we used to take on these three-year SLA contracts and we will provide services and we were rated on our performance. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, God forbid we should be, we should fail uh, on the score and lose money that would like, that would be like hell coming down to earth. Um, and But we also did true ups, which is not written here, but we did true ups. So at the end of the first year, we go and check the volume of work that came from the customer and we could ask for more money and say, you know, the volume is much higher than you told us. That's going to affect our performance. We need to bring additional people. So these were negotiations we did with them, right? Uh, so it details what is the service, reliability, performance, change management, service reviews. These are contractual documents that are agreed to between two parties and you will need to meet the criteria in a service level agreement. You don't need to know this like science, you just need to know what a service level agreement is. So these are service level agreements. Now some of the things that we do when we're trying to agree uh, on the work that we have to do is we need to prioritize. Um, and there are different prioritization techniques that we use and you need to be familiar with this. So I need you guys to really focus here um, on the prioritization techniques. They're very important, especially for agile teams. Agile teams, by the way, uh, we, you know, when you work in an agile, you work with a backlog of features. So rather than saying, like in construction, this is the drawing, this is what this is the architectural drawing, and you know, this is what we're going to construct over a period of a couple of years. Um, instead, and especially in the world of IT, where we use agile heavily, um, where we use agile heavily, we will decide um, that these are the key features that we expect to have in the solution. And based on these key features, some are going to be having higher priority than others. So we work in two weeks uh, sprints. Every, you know, we plan for two weeks. And I can tell you why it's two weeks, the sprint. It's called a sprint, uh, but sprint is like a jump, okay? Uh, so they do two week sprints like this. And two weeks usually represents 10 business days. They agree at the beginning of every sprint, they meaning the project team or the scrum team or uh, agile team, they agree on what will be completed in the next 10 working days um, and management reviews and signs off, okay? So in the 10 days, 
they will expect that every day they will complete 10% of the work. All right, so that by the end of 10 days, 100% of the work will be complete. And they track it using something called a burn down chart. Um, a burn down chart, usually, if this is your if this is your two weeks, like right there, if this represents two weeks over here, then the chart will be this is all the time. And if over here you put the number of tasks that you have, let's say you have 200 tasks or 200 things to complete within two weeks, then you can expect that in the very first day all the tasks exist and by the last day all should have been closed, right? So they will expect a downward trend for the remaining work. Like every day it should be reduced so that in 10 days all the work is completed. This is, the, this is what they do when they work with sprints. In 10 days they want all the work to complete, so every day you should be completing 10% of the work. Um, and so they come up with these two-week sprints and because we have a lot of features and requirements and specifications that your customer may have wanted or your stakeholders, we prioritize them. We think about what should go into the first sprint. Okay, when I'm saying the word sprint for those people who are not familiar with sprints, it is S P R I N T. Okay, sprint. Um, so we're thinking which of these features are going to go into that one sprint. So we put things into a backlog and I'm going to draw a backlog for you. A backlog, let me pick a different color other than red. Here's my backlog. I put it here. My backlog includes several things that we want to complete. Okay. Several things, several features we would like to have in a solution. So let's say your solution is a portal for your banking customers. Okay, uh, and so you talk to all the different stakeholders, they give you lots of features and so on. And so you look at these, you weigh them for how long, the level of effort, and which ones are more important right now, which ones are key. So for example, uh, it is more important to make sure that the customer can have an account that is not accessible by somebody else. That is a lot more important than them having an ability to print, you know, data from that account. The printing I can do later, but it's very important for a person before they can open an account to be sure that nobody else can access their account. So let's say that's this item, then that's going to go into my first sprint, for example. So uh, we will figure out what the priorities are and we'll put them into the first sprint. And we work on making sure that all the things that we're including are doable within a 10 day period. That means we need to specify, test it, implement it, test it and be able to demo the final solution, the final piece or module that we're working on to the management within that 10 day period. It could be just a small thing that we're doing, right? So what you see on the right here is my backlog of the features that I want. And I decided I'm going to put these into the first sprint and we're going to work on them. This backlog is going to be changed as we go along. Right now, these are the priorities, but what's going to happen is Management, I didn't mean to have an error. Management's going to add additional features and requirements based on what? Based on seeing the result of this one sprint. At the end of this sprint here, they will assess the results, they evaluate, and they decide that they need to now, you know, add this feature or, you know, requirement, and you reevaluate the remaining backlog to see which ones are going to go into the next sprint. And that's how they usually work with this backlog. What this allows you to do is to get uh, incremental benefits sooner than waiting for the whole thing to complete. So you start to see benefits as you finish every two weeks. You start to see something real happening in front of you. Uh, and it allows you to change between one and the other. So between um, between here and here, I could make modifications. I can add, you know, additional requirements based on the capabilities that I'm able to see. And that's the benefit of Agile is that we work with small plans, very small plans, two week plans. And the team is very focused in that two weeks. They're not, they don't really change much because they only have a few things in that one sprint. But what they can change is the overall direction. So for the next sprint, the whole strategy could be shifted if they want to. And that's what Agile does, allows you to make changes as you go along. So much better than Waterfall, which is the traditional project management, especially when you have many unknowns, 
there are many um, um, challenges that you could face, um, things that are not so clear, maybe you're doing it for the first time, and so you need to be able to do it in stages and focus on the most important things first, and then allow you to add as you go along, having incremental benefits. So that's how they usually work with a backlog. Um, and now, along with this, I want to introduce to you a few techniques that are used in prioritization, like Kano, Moscow, which has nothing to do with Russia, paired comparison analysis, and 100 points method, all are different techniques for prioritization. The information that I have on the slide, I pulled it up from the internet, I researched them for you guys, and I plugged them in here so you could equally Google these things and you'll find probably similar information. Uh, so Kano, what Kano is, <clears throat> it's not a board game and it's not a card game. Uh, it's a way to assess um, <clears throat> satisfaction of your stakeholders versus the um, functionality that you're producing. And what the Kano model shows is that there are different levels for customer satisfaction, all the way from frustrated to delighted. Okay. Uh, and for functionality, it goes all the way from, let me read it behind my laptop, from no functionality to the best functionality. All right, so this, these are the four areas that you want to look at. Um, there's something uh, called um, attractive, must be, so these are expectations, right, from your customer, and performance. And then there's something called uh, indifference. So let me show you what these different aspects of the Kano are. And don't worry if this is the first time you hear about it, but it's actually a nice thing. So if you look at, let's say, uh, this performance, you will see that as you increase functionality, customer is more satisfied. So these would be things that they had requested or maybe add-ons that please the customer when you add them or you give them better value for that, uh, they are more satisfied. Uh, for them, if you reduce it, okay, because they're expecting this, right, if you reduce the functionality, you'll see that satisfaction will start to drop. This is the satisfaction line here, right? So as you reduce this functionality, this is, these are things they're expecting, so if you give them more of it, they're happier. And if you don't give it to them, they're not going to be happy. Okay. And you have things that are considered nice to have. Uh, so they're not really mandated by the contract, which is the attractive. So if you do them, if you include that functionality, you see that's the functionality going this way. So if you include that functionality, you see that satisfaction increases. But if you don't include the functionality, satisfaction does not really decrease, okay? You see it almost goes flat here. It's not really decreased. Why? These are nice to have. So they were not really expecting them, but if you included it, they will be happy, okay? And then you have the things that must be there, okay? So you do them. There's no excitement. They're not going to be delighted. They're okay with it, right? Um, it's, it must be in there. So if the more, the more you do it, no, no effect because they're expecting it to be there. But if you were not to do them, they're going to be unsatisfied. Okay. If you do it, well, that was expected. Okay. If you do more, uh, did we do more feature? Yeah, we do more. Um, there's no extra satisfaction that comes from it. But if you don't do it, um, then they'll be super unhappy because these are contractual items. The ones that are in the yellow, would be things that if you did more, they would be happy because these are things they didn't really expect that much of, okay? Similar to the attractive nice-to-haves. So these are things they expected, but you gave them better performance so they're happier. These are things they expected, you did, you completed it, it's not going to satisfy them. Um, there's nothing more about it that interests them, so these are things that must be within the contract. Bottom line, Cano model is used to understand the customer mindset towards delivery of um, a certain service to them. Okay. Now, if you want to read more, 
So I got that from this page, Complete Guide to Cano Model, a place called Folding Burritos. Uh, you know, I can probably share the link if you want, but if you look for Cano Model, you probably find one from Folding Burritos, and that's where you find that I got the screenshots. And it has very nice examples. Must be product features are simply expected. If the product does not have them, it will be considered to be incomplete or just plain bad. Um, Okay, the, the, we need to have them, but that won't make our customers more satisfied. They won't be dissatisfied. So basically, they will only be this. They'll be dissatisfied if you don't provide them, but they're not going to be excited if you provide them. It's expected to be done. Whereas the ones that are here, right? Um, internet connection speed, if you give them something faster, obviously they'll be happier. But if you reduce the quality, they'll be unhappy. So you can read it here uh, from Folding Burritos Cano Model. Uh, so the other one is called Musco MSCW. This one, I'm a big fan of it, but this is similar to what we were discussing before. Some things are a must. Now the O's are added just to make it look nice. It's MSCW, it's must, should, could, won't. All right. Um, the must. These are the things that must be in the solution, and therefore they're super high priority. The solution is no good without them. So these are always going to be your highest priority. If you are at a stage in the development of your solution where they are now needed to be done, you, you include them ahead of others, all right? Uh, obviously, some things have to wait until a part of the solution is developed before you get there, but at the right time, the must will have to be included. The should, Things you consider as important, but not vital. They're not nice to have like these. You want these shoulds, but they are not the highest priority. So you can rate them as um, critical to the solution, needed for the solution, all right? But not critical. The could have, you could go without, and if you can afford it, you can include, all right? The should, if you don't include over the long run, the customer is not going to be happy, but the must is a bare minimum has to be in there. All right. So, for example, the ability to log in to your portal for your, you know, your banking, your bank account uh, must have would be, you know, a login with a password. So must have. You don't want everybody else to come in uh, and access your account. Uh, a should have would be the ability to change your password or a notification that goes from the system, um, maybe that's a could have. Um, a should have would be the ability to um, maybe, I don't know for banking accounts, what would be important? Ability to change your password if you want. Okay, so that feature we want, but you could do it a little bit later, but it's very important for, the, for us to have the ability to create that initial account with initial password, all right? Later on, I want you to include the ability for the customer to be able to change uh, the password. That, that needs to be there, but it's not vital in the beginning. It can be done later. Uh, as a nice to have, I would like the system to notify the customer to change the password every three months. Okay, that's a nice to have. What we won't have is automatic changing of passwords for the customer, all right? We're not going to do that. We don't think there's value to that, all right? Or we won't have, I don't know, SMS notification right now to change the password. We will, maybe, we could reevaluate and consider later. So the things that you put as won't, maybe won't now, but later on could be reconsidered for a different release. So a lot of times, you're faced with decisions and you have to decide. So you focus on the things that are critical, the things that are not so critical, take your second priority. If you could afford it, include the nice to haves, the could have, and then the things that I won't have, save them, they could be evaluated for later. That's what Moscow is. Must, should, could, won't. It's a way to, a lot of IT teams use this, and I'm sure some of you have used something similar, either with numbers, high, medium, low, things like that but we use similar means of categorizing, you know, requirements that we could put into the solution. All right, the other one is paired comparison analysis, and this is to compare one against the other. So if you have a lot of things that you want to consider, uh, you can rate and rank against each other. You obviously don't rank it against itself, 
uh, but you can rank it against the other options. So option A versus option B, which one is more important, option A versus option C. This one here is called the 100 points method, where you give everybody 100 points to use. So you put all the requirements or features and you say you have 100 points. Let's say Joe gets 100 points. So Joe, um, here we have it as marketing representative, IT manager, business head. Everybody gets 100 points. These are the four things they're uh, you know, voting against, voting on. And so they could take the 100 and put it all on one, split it amongst twos, divide it amongst all four. It's really up to them, depending on the weightage they see. And so you see that the marketing representative put 30 points against customer registration, whereas IT manager gave 35 points to tracking order and business said give the highest point 35 to all customer registration. Everybody is putting the weight as they wish. They could put zero all the way to 100, but the total of all the scores that they give cannot be more than 100. And so when you add them up, you'll see that customer registration got uh, 55, 35, 90. And this got less, less. I think that was the highest. This one, 25 and 35, 60 and 20, 80. So that's the second highest and so on. So you could rank them like this by everybody putting a total of 100 points as they see fit. They will score it as they, as they like. All right. If you want, you know, there's other techniques that, that are not here. I can say put, you know, score them force rank one to four, for example. Uh, you cannot repeat one twice or four twice. Give your highest priority a one, then the second a two, and then I can see overall how they rated it. And then I can use that to prioritize. So these are all techniques for us to be able to prioritize on, you know, specifications or requirements that we need on our project. All right, so we could also use um, performance reports to tell us how to um, focus our work. The section that we're doing right now is agreeing, right? We're agreeing, we're negotiating on the deliverables. So we can look at our performance, we can look at what has been completed, we can look at metrics and quality expectations, we can look at the whole schedule beginning to end, we can look at changes, defects, costs, and so on. Um, and based on this, we, we're able to form decisions on what should be done next. We can look at issues and how what actions we need to uh, take to address. Um, and we can look at the progress on the backlog, how much has been done, what is not done, and these performance reports that, are, that should be frequent within the team should allow us to prioritize our efforts and negotiate what should be happening next and agree on the next step to take. Uh, this, um, this is not a step-by-step -step procedure that we're providing here. We're just saying by reviewing performance reports and looking at what has been completed, what's still left, how much it's costing, how long it's taking, the issues that we're facing, we're able to prioritize our efforts better on the things that are more critical. You can always check with subject matter experts. So whenever they mention expert judgment, what they mean is people within the organization that can give you some insight. They have the right background. Could be technical, could be legal, could be whatever. But we can consult with these people every now and then to help us in making decisions on what should be next, where our priorities need to be. Uh, we need to have a negotiation strategy uh, that we will use. Uh, and they tell you what you do in a traditional and an agile, for example. In a traditional project approach, an important objective is a clear designation of the intended deliverables for the project and how they will be measured and compensated. A clear designation of the project's intended deliverables. So we know what needs to be delivered. These things are assigned, they're expected to be delivered. In the agile uh, approach, the exact deliverables will be variable because every sprint completes something and the customer can modify, add, and reprioritize the things in the backlog. And so, uh, clearly delineated ways to ensure agreed performance levels must be defined, which is usually uh, meetings that are done prior to that sprint actually happening. They review, they prioritize the backlog, they agree what will go into that one sprint, and this is the negotiation strategy that they use based on priorities from the backlog. In the traditional, there isn't. We know what needs to be done and we will measure it you know, at the time that we expect it to happen. So us as a PM and team, we need to agree on the parameters for success and negotiate, you know, if we feel there's any kind of disagreement, All right. So with Agile, they agree just before the sprint 
uh, based on priorities from the backlog with traditional these deliverables have already been assigned from before for the next couple of years or so and you know at the right time we will check if they've been done or not typically we have resource calendars who will be joining when you know or even machines and material when we will have them and so on and we may need to also discuss these and negotiate them and agree uh, that this is suitable or enough so we may look for key resource attributes attributes means um, you know, descriptive aspects of these people. So it could be capabilities like skills and so on. How many do we need? When do we need them? And these could be points of discussion. Uh, and this whole section is about having agreement before you start working on your project. If you have any previous experience working with this team or this organization, your lessons learned from before could be beneficial to improve on this one now. Um, as we roll out solutions, uh, or we go live with these solutions, we need to agree on something called a blackout period. And a blackout period, if you I know some of you might be familiar with this, a blackout period means no changes can happen at that time because we're testing what we just did. So this is not a good time for you to be modifying anything. So at the time that we hand over a solution, we suspend all changes, and this will ensure that we're able to properly test what we just finished, okay? Go live, usually, I think go live is pretty clear from what it is. This is when we are rolling out a piece or release of our solution with the go live. Always recommended that you agree on the blackout period when nothing can be changed because we are rolling out going live with a specific solution. In an agile approach, there could be numerous releases of aspects of the solution because they're working in sprints. So they're going to be releasing different aspects of that solution, different pieces of it over the timeline and blackout times if needed will be negotiated as we approach every release okay when we're about to release for example the new printing capability from your banking account we need to agree that no other team within the organization or within the project team is actually making changes at that time because we need to make sure this rollout is happening with everything else on hold so we can properly see the outcome of it right if we roll it out and somebody is still making changes then we don't know if that's what affected the release that we just had so go live is for releases along with that we need to discuss how much of a blackout period we need where they cannot make any changes okay um, the objectives for project agreement <coughs> is to is to have clarity and this is what this section was about on how the different parties are going to report and verify that we are meeting the expectations. We need to know what it is that we're supposed to be uh, delivering. So we need to have deliverables and we have to have acceptance criteria for them. In a traditional project, this is usually done early on. We know all the deliverables, when they're supposed to have, so when they're supposed to happen. We know what would you know look like a good, acceptable solution so for example if you want to test out the log on you know there is an expectation that we do user acceptance testing this is the acceptance criteria that if the uat or user acceptance testing is successful and somebody is able to log in or maybe able to register then this is um, this is a confirmation that this deliverable has been satisfied um, in an agile approach the actual deliverables will vary as the backlog is added to reprioritize and so on, each story needs to have clearly defined acceptance criteria as per the customer. And they could also have a definition of done for the project release iterations and user stories. So an agile is a lot more broken down than a traditional. Traditional, most of the time, it's a testing or inspection of different modules that you do them. They are pre-planned in advance. We know what we're expecting. If it's construction, you know, digging the ground, which is called excavation, they can inspect after you finish with the excavation and they can test to see that the excavation was done correctly or not. In Agile, everything changes. At the end of every sprint, there could be additional requirements being added, reprioritized, and what was important now may be less important later, depending. But they would usually have uh, a definition for what is considered good progress, I guess, um, 
but that's usually tied to certain time frames or iterations or releases and so on, or maybe by quantity of these requirements, which sometimes we refer to them as user stories. Uh, in Agile, they re most requirements are collected as user stories. Uh, we write them as, you know, this is a feature that a user wants because they need it for some work that they do. Uh, so they will measure your performance that way. And so here we need to agree on the objectives that are expected out of this one project. And that's what this is saying. 